Hey everybody, welcome to Community Bible Study. Today we're talking about John 15. My name is Patty Peretti, uh, and I would love it if you would open up your Bibles, please, to one of the most important chapters in the Gospel of John. At least I think it is. Maybe it just is to me. I think it is so terribly important because of this vivid and precise picture it gives to us of what union with Christ really is, what the Christian life actually is, not a life of striving and trying, but a life of abiding. What a beautiful word that is, abiding. Uh, it is um, what it means to live a Christian life, to be a Christian, it means to abide with Christ. The vine and the branches depict the union with Christ that defines the life of a Christian. So we're gonna take a good hard look at this metaphor and pick it apart a little bit. Before I do that, I wanna read um, the first 11 verses of the Gospel of John. Uh, these are Jesus' words. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. What a glorious, <coughs> glorious thought that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for these beautiful and miraculous words, and we ask that you would help us to understand them. Lord, I pray that we will abide, that we will abide in the vine, and I pray that your words will abide in us. May these words penetrate deeply into our heart and just set us off to pray and abide more deeply. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, verse one, verse one rather, is the, the last of the I am statements. It's the seventh one, uh, and it's the only one that actually runs into an additional assertion, and my father is the vine dresser. So you could call him the gardener or the farmer maybe even, uh, but certainly Jesus, the son's role is central to these verses, but the father's role is not insignificant. He is the one who prunes, he shapes, he trims, uh, maybe it's a good time to mention that a gardener does more than just prune, just in case we worry that he does, but he doesn't rather. He, he waters, he 
provides shade to keep the plant from too much sun. He ensures that the plant gets enough sun. He regulates the temperature. In bad weather, he maybe even props up the plant with additional support uh, or coverings that will protect it from severe elements. Basically, the vine dresser does whatever is necessary to keep the branches providing maximum fruit. Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. True, of course, meaning genuine and real. Other places in the Old Testament, in Psalm 80 and Jeremiah 2.21, for example, God calls Israel a vine. Unfortunately, what's highlighted in those verses is Israel's failure to produce good fruit. In Jeremiah 2.21, God stresses that he had planted a choice vine and they had degenerated into a wild vine. In Isaiah 5, the choice vine yielded wild grapes grapes not in keeping with the vine that the vine dresser had planted. A different kind of grape, a wild one, one of their own making, not what the gardener had planted. In contrast to that failure, Jesus is the final real vine as opposed to the one to whom Israel pointed the true vine, the vine that brings forth good fruit. Israel foreshadowed the vine. Jesus is the true vine. In the same way that God refers to Israel as my son in the Old Testament, Jesus is the true son, the true son as he was meant to be, a son who has the characteristics of his father, a reflection of who his father is. Jesus has already in this uh, Gospel of John superseded the temple and Moses and all the religious rituals and here he supersedes even Israel. And he tells us in verse 2, in verse 2, that every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, he the vine dresser, my father. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it will bear more fruit. Now, this, I think, makes some of us a little bit nervous. It's a little confusing, and it takes a little sifting through to understand exactly who Jesus is talking about here. So I want to pause for a few minutes and think this through. Uh, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So we'll start there with that first statement. The questions are, who are these branches in me that do not bear fruit? Is Jesus talking about people who do not believe in him or who do not abide in him? Or is he describing Christians who are not producing fruit? The wording in me is a little confusing. Is he saying that a person could be in him, meaning uh, be a believing Christian and then be cut off? And could he be thrown away and burned as it's described in verse 8? Those are a lot of questions. So let's uh, tackle them. First of all, I want to say a couple of things about when passages in scripture are kind of murky and difficult to understand. The first, first thing to say is keep reading. Uh, especially in the Gospel of John, the text will clarify itself. You know, that's why at the beginning of every CBS book, early on in the book, uh, you'll read this little blurb where it says, You'll benefit most from the study if you read the entire scripture passage prayerfully before you start answering the questions. Uh, scripture enlightens itself as it goes along, and John is especially true that way. I have found that as I have read it over and over, 
its meaning becomes, becomes much more evident because it clarifies itself. Uh, scripture must always be read in light of other scripture. Scripture clarifies and enlightens other scripture. I've heard Alistair Begg say many times, the plain things are the main things and the main things are the plain things. And he says that in that wonderful Scottish accent so much better than I say it. So what about verse two? Could Jesus be saying, yes, you could be attached to my vine in a believing, abiding kind of way and then be cut off? Is that what he's saying? So let's look at what other scripture says about that very question. Turn with me to John 6, 37. John 6, 37. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So let's start with the first part of that verse. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Uh, you can clearly see here where Jesus places his confidence. His confidence is not on some well-meaning, well-intended people trying to work their way to Jesus in belief. His confidence is in his Father to bring about his own redemptive purpose. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Gives me. All that he gives will come to the Son. You see, Jesus confidence in the success of his mission rests wholly in and on the confidence he has in his Father. The second part of that verse is interesting. This is what it says, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. It is implied that those who come to Jesus are those the Father has given him. Uh, the second part of this verse is an interesting thing. It's formally called uh, Latitides, which is a figure of speech. Um, it's an ironic understatement in which an affirmation is expressed by the negative of its contrary. Now that sounds very complicated, but it's actually super easy. It means, for example, you won't be sorry means you'll be glad, right? You won't be sorry is the affirmative. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, you get it. You won't be sorry means you'll be glad. So whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Meaning whoever comes to me, I will keep in. I will preserve. So it means all that the Father gives to Jesus as his gift to his Son will surely come to him and whoever comes to him as a consequence of the Father's gifting Jesus will take measure to keep in and to preserve. So the second half of this verse moves from coming to preserving. I will never drive away means I will certainly keep in. That is really good news, especially good news for some of you who worry. I know there are people who worry. Am I really saved? How do I know I'm a Christian? Will I persevere to the end? John 3, John 6, 37 rather, should put an end to that concern Preach it to yourself. You can be sure that the enemy is preaching the opposite. So preach it to yourself. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. John 10, 27 and 28 is further evidence. If you need any more, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life 
and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will ever snatch them out of his hand. You see, your salvation does not rest on you, but on Jesus. Because it rests with Christ, I can rely on it. If I thought for a moment that the success of my Christian life depended on me and my ultimate destination in heaven was all up to me, I would be a nervous wreck. But praise God, Christ will hold me fast. So here's the last proof. 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. John 15, 2 is not describing people who once were Christians and then cut off. That is to push this metaphor too far. Metaphors can only go so far, and otherwise they start saying things that, they, that simply are not true and that the author never intended. Jesus would never contradict what he had so plainly declared. The purpose of this metaphor is to state that there are no true Christians without some measure of fruit. If we need an example of a branch that bears no fruit, we need to look no further than Judas Iscariot. I mean, he walked with Jesus for three years and he probably seemed very much like the other disciples but he was not attached to the vine. Every person who professes to be a disciple of Christ is not necessarily a follower of Christ. You've probably known people like that. I have, unfortunately. People who seem like Christians for a time, but eventually they tire of it and they are cut off because they were never really attached to the vine. A branch that bears no fruit is dead and is cut off like Judas. Like the people John describes in chapter 2 verse 23, there were many who believed in the name of Jesus when they saw the signs that he was doing, but Jesus, verse 24, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He did not need anyone to tell him about the hearts of human beings. He knows what is in the heart of human beings. The same thing is true in John 6, 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Fruitfulness is the mark of a true Christian. A branch with no fruit is just dead wood. There is no life in them. Otherwise, they would have been pruned and not cut off. It's really not possible to conceive of a branch with no fruit. If that were possible, it would call into question the credibility of Christ as the true vine filled with nutrients that empowers growth. The true vine produces fruit in the branches in keeping with the vine. Any branch attached to him would produce fruit. They could do no other. See, Jesus has already introduced the idea of, of the mutual indwelling of believers in Christ in chapter 14. You are in me and I am in you. The same idea is portrayed here in this picture of the vine. In 1420, Jesus said, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He's kind of drawing a parallel between Jesus' reliance on the Father and our reliance on the vine, on Jesus. And the image of the vine is so helpful to us because it's so vivid. Jesus is the vine. His disciples, his followers are, are attached to him. They are the branches. 
the branches get their life from the vine. The vine produces its fruit through the branches, but the vine produces it. The vine is the one that has everything necessary to get that fruit into and on the branches. The branches do not produce the fruit, the vine does. He's the only one who provides life and nutrients to the branches. We bring no nutrients, no life to him. It's flowing completely one way from him to us. And it's a vivid picture of what it means to abide in Christ. We dwell in him. We get our life from him. We have our very existence in him. No branch has life in itself. It is completely dependent for life and fruitfulness on the vine to which it is attached. That living branch, the branch that is alive and not dead, is in the vine and the vine is in the branch. There is union between the vine and the branch John 14, 20, you in me and I in you. And the Father, the heavenly gardener, does two things. He cuts off every non-fruit bearing branch, every dead branch, and he prunes or trims every branch that does bear fruit. And no fruit bearing branch is exempt from that pruning. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 describes a very similar idea. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Verse 5 says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My sons, do not regard lightly the, dis the dis discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when, weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens every son whom he receives. God is treating you as sons. Verse 10 says, For they, meaning our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I've been pruned many times, over and over and over again. And it is not fun at the time. But we need to embrace his pruning because it is evidence of his care for us. We can't kick at it or think it's God being negligent. We can't say that God does not love us or is not interested in us or is angry at us and then dismiss his pruning as just random and unuseful. When we do that, we waste his pruning. We waste his kind attention and we refuse to be trained by it. Jesus wants us to see that his father, the vine dresser, regulates and governs our pruning. It is not pointless. It is not random. It has a purpose. And that purpose is stated at the end of verse 2, that it might bear more fruit. The Father is regulating things externally that will cause us to bear more fruit. And why bear more fruit? Verse 8 answers, my Father is glorified by your fruit bearing, which by the way also proves you are my disciples. Your hardships will glorify your Father in heaven and bring you into deeper enjoyment and union with the vine. 
stronger reliance on the vine. Jesus says in verse 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. What an unbelievable thought that Jesus actually gives us his joy. It's not just our joy, a little ours and a little his, and they kind of mix up. This is his joy, his joy in us as partakers of his divine nature, his joy in us, and our joy being full. Verse 3 says something sort of interesting. Jesus says, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now, the word I have spoken to you, Christ's word, his logos, his teaching, himself, the logos incarnate, has taken hold in their lives. Christ's word, all that he is and all that he's doing, brings life to them as the vine brings life to the branches. Verse 3 reminds me of John 13. When Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, when he came to Peter, you may remember, Peter said to him, oh Lord, no, 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 no. You will never wash my feet. I cannot possibly let you do that. I'm sure he's thinking, I can't let you demean yourself by washing my feet. That's not right. And Jesus said back to him, if I do not wash you, you have no share in me. Whereupon Peter responded, then Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus said in 13.10, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean, but not every one of you, not Judas. He's talking about pruning and then he says, you are clean. Even those who are clean are still going to be pruned. Cleaning and pruning are kind of similar, right? They are both getting rid of something. Cleaning is eliminating dirt. Pruning is eliminating the branches, the leaves, the weeds, whatever, that do not serve the vine, that do not serve fruit production. There's actually an interesting play on words in Greek that you can't really see in English. In Greek, the word for prune is the same as the word for cleanse. And the word for clean is a related word. I'm going to try to pronounce this. It's, it's not going to be easy. It's katharē and katharoi. Uh, those are the two words for cleaning and, gre and cleaning and pruning. And Jesus is playing with those words. With They sound the same. They are related. It's not evident to us non-Greek speaking people, but pruning and cleaning are similar. The father prunes, he cleanses, he prunes, he cleanses to make the branches more appropriate for fruit bearing, which is God glorifying and disciple proving. But then Jesus says, you are already clean already cleansed, already pruned, already made appropriate for fruit bearing, yet you will still be pruned. Remember what Jesus said to Peter, if I do not wash you, you can have no part of me, yet you are clean. Peter accepted being washed by Jesus. John Piper says, your ready acceptance of being washed and pruned is the sign that you are already washed and pruned. Interesting. Already washed, already pruned. It has happened in the past. 15.3, the second half of that says, because of the word that I have spoken to you, the word, 
being the whole of Christ, his message, his person, his mission, all that he is and all that he has done and all that he has said. That's the word I have spoken to you. Believing him is the connection to him. Remember, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Believing is the means that God uses to join us, the branch, to the vine. It's what attaches us in union with Christ Jesus. And in the moment of that attachment, that joining, that belief, uh, the merging of the branch to the vine, you are made clean. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes, believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Already passed from death to life. Jesus tells his disciples, you are already clean. You have passed from death to life. You will never be cut off from this vine. You are already clean. Yet there is still some pruning to do. Jesus says, you are already clean. And then he says, abide in me. So there is something that we have to do and there is something that has already been done. What's already happened, you've been made clean. At the moment of your faith, you have been made clean. What's going to happen? You're going to abide in the vine. And my father, the vine dresser, will prune you as he sees fit. Why prune what's already been pruned? Why clean what has already been made clean? The Father is pruning, is making you what you already are in his sight. Your obedience in abiding and preserving through his pruning is you becoming what you are. He is making us what he has already declared us to be. We are clean. We are forgiven. But our, father continu our Father's continued pruning shapes us into what we are and makes us ready and suited to bear more fruit. And He is glorified when you bear much fruit. And for us, for the branches in the vine, that is the point of life, glorifying our Father. He is sanctifying you in ways that will prove you are a disciple and bring him glory. It reminds me of Philippians 3.12 when Paul says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has already made me his own. I wish we had more time, but let me just finish with this quick encouragement. Pray. Pray, 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 pray more. Pray to abide. Pray that his words will abide in you. Pray to understand what that even means. Pray for his joy to be in you. Pray for his love to be in you. As those who abide in the vine, we are... Uh, as 2 Peter 1, 4 says, we are partakers of the divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. Pray that his fruit will be visible in us, that he might be glorified by our reliance on the vine that is Christ Jesus. Father, help us to abide, and Lord, may your words increasingly abide in us. May we come to understand what that looks like. In your Son's glorious name, the vine.
Amen. Thank you all so much. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time.